just to start off, I want to spend you know five or ten minutes telling you a little bit about Plateau, kind of as your lunch sponsor normally would, and then we'll do a an educational piece on the uh, the wildlife tax valuation and, and kind of what that means to landowners and to realtors. We're going to talk a little bit about the residential implications of that in a development setting. Um, and any time during the presentation, during that part of it, if you have any questions about anything, just let me know. There's a lot of material in this presentation. I'm kind of going to click through it pretty good. Um, so. How much time do you actually have? Whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, All right. I'll we'll we'll finish up at least by four. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. So I am with, with Plateau Land and Wildlife Management. My name's Craig Bowen. Um, Hope is here with me. She uh, she assists our sales team and sales and marketing team in uh, many, many, many endeavors and is one of the, the cogs that if it fell off, the ship would sink. Um, so you can thank Hope for the food and for being here and get everything set up. and. Uh, Reminded me where to come and all that. So <laughs> uh, we do. Uh, we do. In that note, we do have a, a large team. We're the we're by far the largest uh, uh, land and wildlife company in the in the world, as far as I know, uh, but certainly in the in the nation. Um, we have uh, our our team consists of, of biologists, uh, field technicians, registered property tax consultants. Uh, we're about a 17-year-old company as of 19 uh, as of. Uh, uh, 2013, so we were established in 1997. Um, our founders, um, David Braun and Burl Armstrong, who are both from the Austin area, you may know uh, each of them, um, they, uh, they helped establish this wildlife management valuation law. So we were the original company that focused on this law and, and helping landowners convert to it, and we're still by far the largest one doing it. Um, we started out here around Central Texas, Hayes and Travis County mainly. Uh, it's still where the bulk of our business comes from, believe it or not. We did more more wildlife management plans in Hayes County last year than we ever had in our in our basically what was our 15th tax year. So that's pretty incredible. Uh, most of Hayes County is in the wildlife tax valuation at this point. Uh, I don't know how much business you guys do there, but it's uh, it's very prevalent as far as rural life. Um, like I said, we do have a staff of wildlife biologists. Uh, there's five or six of them now. Um, from the from the sort of staff level up to our, our senior consultants, they're all master's level guys that really know what they're talking about. Uh, we've also got a team of field technicians kind of scattered throughout there that uh, that are boots on the ground guys. They're out there doing fire ant treatment and, and using chainsaws and checking nest boxes and doing all those kinds of things because any wildlife management plan we write, we can also implement 100% uh, of it and and do for a large number of our of our clients. So. Uh, that's kind of what our what our uh, business revolves around. We don't just do the tax things. Uh, we also uh, do some high level consulting with developers and other things. David Braun also own, owns Braun and Gresham. I uh, just wanted to mention this. They are attorneys that their entire office focuses solely on rural land ownership, land ownership. So condemnation, estate planning, um, uh, you know, wills and trusts, conservation easements is a big part of their business. Um, they do all of that stuff. They only do stuff for, for rural landowners and, and rollback taxes. Owners. Yes, all all right. yeah. mm -hmm. um, property tax disputes. I mean, they're they're at ARB hearings, you know, weekly. Mm -hmm. So definitely a, a good choice for that if, if your clients or yourself have any have any interest or any need for that. So kind of a little bit about what I do. Um, my title is account manager. About half of my job is sales and marketing, and the other half of it is, is client retention and, and uh, management of current clients' accounts, making sure they have everything they need from the company. Um, this is kind of my patch right here that I manage. A guy named Casey Mock does all of this over here. Um, and together we, we, we manage every one of Plateau's clients. Um, touch them on a monthly basis and uh, uh, make sure that they've got everything they need from us. And uh, if, they, if somebody signs up with us and comes into the fold in, in this green region, then they'll be dealing with me. Um, and uh, Cameron Bain, Hope, uh, Tim Milligan, our director, our sales director, um, all of us take good care of our clients so, and, uh, and talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one, -on -one basis. Um, I mentioned the implementation. We have a line of products that Plateau biologists developed, and we have manufactured for us uh, in a, 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 from a manufacturer in San Antonio. Um, so when I say we implement um, these plans, it's not just, you know, we can go out there and cut a tree down. Um, we have a whole line of products that are custom to us that we don't, you know, buy and then, and then, and then double retail. They're made for us and we, we manage those and monitor those so they're, they're uh, the best they can be each year. Um, funny story about this, this, this thing right here, this is a platform bird feeder. We designed it for turkeys, but it's a songbird feeder. 
uh, as well. It works really well, high capacity, 220 pounds of seed, you know, so it feeds a lot of songbirds all at once. You don't have to fill it very often. Well, we thought we'd perfected it. Um, through the years, it's gone through several, several iterations and things were wrong with it, you know, and so we're getting better and better at these products. And this last one, we thought it was just spot on, right? Well, come to find out, one of our clients called us and said, a raccoon's been getting on that turkey feeder, and you guys said that that probably wouldn't happen. And we said, well, it shouldn't be happening. I don't know how that's happening. The legs come up into the center of it, and, you know, nothing should be able to get on top of it that doesn't have wings, right? And found out that there was a little bitty lip up under this up under this platform, about that big, and this raccoon would jump up and grab that lip <laughs> and then flip himself <laughs> over oh my God, really? Really? and get on that. Yeah, fingers, yeah, yeah. it's like a 007 raccoon, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty incredible story. So, <laughs> next year we're going to make some corrections <laughs> to that and grip that lip. And in fact, I think we already did. We didn't have to change much to that. Yeah. PJ, PJ said you had to you had to crimp that lip, and so they started doing that for us. But did, you, yeah. you, <laughs> did you photograph that? They actually got a picture of a raccoon, raccoon hanging on the deal. <laughs> yeah. and so we asked about ascertaining that that's the only way he could have gotten there from that position was just. A, so I certainly could not do that. I don't know how to put it people are, but uh, definitely good. So they're smart enough to build ladders in the forest. Yeah, exactly. I have seen them stand on top of each other, no yeah. joke, um, to get to a corn feeder. Yes, yeah. Yeah. incredible animals. But anyway, just a funny story about our products. They're all uh, they're all really great products, really really well built. So if you have people that, that know, in terms of our, our wildlife management plans. Um, we're always really upfront about our pricing and all of that. So for about what we're going to talk about this wildlife tax valuation, we write those plans and submit them to the appraisal district, and I'll teach you all about that. But just know that our service generally in that tax that tax um, plan service usually costs about two thousand dollars. So if you've got somebody that wants to move into wildlife, it's always just you can tell them two thousand bucks. Plateau can take care of you, and it's going to be pretty close to that, unless they own just a large, large acre. So up to a couple hundred acres, you know, two hundred, two thousand dollars is a really safe, uh, safe number to, to give them. That's um, for the plan. Not for that's the for the plan. It's not per year. It's not does not include the implementation, but it's a flat fee just to write the plan and get it uh, submitted to the appraisal district and get it approved. Okay. So just so you know, um, and that's the biggest. And this is the segue kind of into the rest of my talk. That's the biggest thing that we tell people is just have a plan. It's very very important that if you're go if you're buying a new property, particularly and you're trying to go into wildlife tax valuation or, or that's something you're thinking about, you know, you need to be thinking about all these things. Your budget, what species you want to manage for, what your property is good for. Uh, you guys as realtors um, have, a, in my mind, a huge responsibility um, to, to be able to tell a client what the property can do. Um, because they may ask you, and we've had, it, we've had that go the wrong way uh, uh, sometimes. We had a client in uh, Hayes County buy what he thought was going to be a great vineyard property. And you'd be hard pressed to grow a blade of grass on it, um, let alone a great vineyard. So, um, you know, it's just uh, it's just one of those things. But the realtor told him, "Yeah, it'd be super. You know, let's go to the closing table." Um, and uh, so that 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 kind of thing is what we want to what we want to try to help and, and educate folks and um, and all of that. So, um, does anybody have any questions about Plateau, our business? I'm not going to sell you any more than anything else, but. I have a question about what you just said. Okay. So if that's our responsibility, or at least partly, how would we, I mean, I wouldn't be able to determine what a piece of land is good for, right. necessarily. Yeah. So sure. Well, if somebody asks me, and that's, and, and that's going to be a, uh, and that's going to be a, a, an issue and a, con and a concern in the sales, you know, use us as a resource. Um, we have we have consulting products. We have things that where we can come out with you and evaluate a piece of property. Uh, we can help you show the landowner that property and give give your give our opinion. Um, so so what, what, do you have an hourly charge? For yeah, that we we yeah. charge our, our hourly hourly rate for our biologist is one hundred thirty dollars an hour. But we have a consulting site visit that's a flat rate of like five ninety five, where we would just come out with you, help you walk around the property, look at it. Five ninety five hundred ninety five dollars. Right. Yeah, Six hundred bucks. And um, and then get to give you a report after that, and you can ask any question you want during that site visit. It can be so oh, what oh. you know is there a, is, is this a good place to build a tank? Is there a better place to build a tank? Um, mm -hmm. Will it be a good grape orchard someday or a grape vineyard someday? Olives is a big deal. We get that question all the time. Can I grow mm -hmm. olives? Here one time? You know, so all those questions can be answered on a site visit like that, and we can get as in depth. Um, 
as you want as far as those consulting projects uh -huh. go. If you've got a multi-million dollar deal that really hinges on some of this stuff, then we, can, we can create a package for you that, that would answer those questions and, and get, you, get you set up with the information you need. And, um, you know, you've all got my business card in there. If you, if you just come across a question you don't know the answer to, my time is pretty cheap as far as the company's concerned. You know, it's my job to be a resource for you folks. So if you just have a question, just call me. Uh, don't hesitate to call me uh, anytime. And if, and if it's something I need to charge you for, I'll say, you know what, that's, that's something we can help you with, but I need to pay for it. And uh, we'll talk about what that looks like. Is that helpful? Yeah. Guy, but you have somebody that, that specializes in ponds. Right. You have, you know, specifics. We, we do. We, have, we don't have a pond guy and a soils guy and all of that. We have, our team of biologists though is extremely diverse. You know, we've got a biologist that's much better at birds than he is at deer. And we've got a guy that's much better at deer than he is at other things. And that goes a lot deeper than that. We, we've got somebody that, that uh, in fact, I'm kind of the person that, that probably knows the most about pond, pond construction. I've just had a little experience with it. So I even act in that capacity every once in a while. Um, but all of our guys are trained in, in all of those aspects of ecology. These are not just, you know, a guy that knows a lot about deer or a guy that knows a lot about turkey. They're ecologists. Yeah. And what that means is they they know a lot about soil yeah. conditions. They know a lot about um, geology. They know a lot about all the kinds of things that you would need to make that happen. Okay. Now, we do at times hire a specialist. I've got a land use plan going in Montgomery County right now that's a multi-thousand dollar deal um, that... Um, Actually, it's over ten thousand uh, dollars. That's a land use plan. Well, we're saying to this guy, uh, or he's saying to us, I don't know anything about what I'm about to do with this property. Yeah. Um, and I need a plan that says, what's my timber? What's my timber good for? What's my brush management plan? Um, what's my game management plan? What's my hunting strategies out here? What's my road? What do my roads look like? Where do I build a well? We're going through that plan line item by line item and answering all those questions for him. And it takes an incredible amount of time. But we're hiring a forestry specialist for this job. Yeah. Because we're not forestry specialists, and we don't have anybody on our team that just says, you know what, I know everything there is no about timber. So we haven't found a guy that does, and we're charging for his time, and we're building that in. So we're not scared to say, hey, we need somebody here. It's just as far as ponds, it never really has happened. We're, we're, we're as good at that as, uh, as almost anybody is. So. Uh, um, but you know, if it if it came to pass where we didn't we didn't know something about about it, we'll get rid of somebody like does. So, so okay. do, are you guys licensed by the state or or anything like that? I mean, does it require that? We're registered property tax consultants, so that's uh, that's through the Texas uh, Division of Licensing and Regulation. Mm -hmm. But this uh, other stuff is the other stuff doesn't require any sort of uh -huh. special license. Now, if you're a timber expert, there's some stuff you can get. Our guys are certified wildlife biologists through the uh, uh, National Wildlife Society. Um, I'm an associate wildlife biologist through those guys, so that's one accreditation you can get. There's, there's so many of those you can get that we try to, we try to balance it out and have them more we think we need them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they're certified on some level in, in quite a few things. So one other question. So if, if a, I've got a property for sale in Blanco County, okay, and it's got ag exemption. They, they run. It, it's a, you know, a subdivision though of 99 lots. And the property I've got for sale is 8.8 acres okay. within that subdivision. So they have an ag exemption, mm -hmm. and the the uh, but they they run uh, uh, black buck antelope okay. there. Uh, so w would they have consulted with you or a company <coughs> like your company? To, in order to get that? Probably not, because if they would have consulted with us, we'd have told them to make those lots a little bigger because they can, they're they're basically stuck in ag now. They can never convert that entire um, development to wildlife if they wanted to at some point uh, because of the size of those lots. Um, they're doing black buck because that's considered a hoofstock. Exotic animals are considered hoofstock, not wildlife. And so they have an ag valuation for those black buck. Ah. And they're stuck with it. So. Um, you know, is, is that Ranges of Brushy Top? Is that where that is? Uh, no, it's uh, so, Summit at Cypress. Okay, all right. Uh, Brushy Top does a similar thing. I don't know if you know about that development. But, um, I'm going to answer some questions about the uh, the Minnow Makers requirement and talk a little bit about that as far as what it means in wildlife in this presentation. Mm -hmm. So we might circle back around to that and talk about it more. And before you start, just for perspective purposes or context, can you tell us the typical clients that would hire you? Mm -hmm. 
Sure, our, our average landowner, our mean landowner is about 70 acres, something like that. Uh, the median is much higher than that because we've got you know some other some other larger properties uh, that, that kind of skew the median. But, the median. but um, we work with clients that are 10 acres, and we work or even smaller than that actually. We got some folks out like Lake Oaks Ranch that are seven acres, and we've got clients that own 10,000 acres. So we've got a very very broad range of experience and clientele. Um, just to give you some statistics, we've converted about 700,000 acres into the wildlife tax valuation, and we work. Actively in the last five years, we worked with about 3,500 landowners. So you know, it's uh, it's a just to give you some context there as far as as far as what we'll do. It's almost anything concerning rural land and, and management of that. And and is there a primary purpose to maximize the benef the tax benefit, or do they have other purposes that they need you for? I'd say our average landowner, it's they're they're 60-40. They want to make sure their taxes stay exactly where they're at and don't ever change, and that's their main concern because it's money. Money, you know, Johnny Manziel, right? Money. <laughs> um, I'm the Aggie, so I can make money. <laughs> um, so it's all about that. But um, but most of them have at least some modicum of interest in wildlife management and, and, and general ecology and making sure that they're doing the right things for their property. Um, we have clients that are way on the other end of the spectrum that they, you know, taxes are, are you know, their taxes aren't going to be that high anyway because they only own 15 acres. But they really want to manage that 15 acres for eastern bluebirds and they want to do it exactly right. And those folks are, are uh, you know, they're kind of, they're a little bit more fun to work with sometimes because they really want to do those things and, and spend some money and spend some time and energy, you know, doing it right. Um, our developer clients, you can answer that yourself. Uh, we work with lots and lots of developments and they're only concern is that tax valuation and how little can I do um, to manage these stupid birds or whatever, deer or whatever they're managing for, um, to get that tax valuation where it needs to be. And that's fine too. Uh, now we try to educate and, and sway them a little bit into that curve, um, but you know I, I call it the wildlife tax evasion. Um, <laughs> but uh, we try not to we try not to keep them on that level. We try to sway them a little bit and teach them that hey, even though you're not doing very much or you don't feel like you're doing very much, this is really helping. And we try to show them trends of the wildlife that they're seeing on that property. And uh, believe it or not, most of them eventually say, you know what, this will let me sell this property because I've been doing the right things out here, even though I started out with a bad attitude. On it. <laughs> Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Anything else? Tax evasion plus a good attitude. <laughs> That's all it takes. Okay, so this presentation, I, I, I kind of titled it Beyond it's Taxes. Um, yeah. It's generally the one where I give folks that, that uh, like yourselves, that you're not just concerned about the tax valuation. I'm sure you want to learn, learn a little bit about stewardship and all that. But we always want to start out with this basic question. What is the wildlife tax valuation? What the heck is it? So the first thing I can tell you is it's an alternative to agricultural use. It is the, the other way to get your taxes at that level. All right. The law was passed in 1995, and we'll talk about it, but up until then, there was no other recourse to have a, an ag-level tax valuation unless, unless you're an ag, unless you're doing cows or sheep or hay or goats or something with ag. If you're a rural landowner and you wanted your property taxes to be low, that was it. So this is an, this is an alternative to that because it stopped making sense um, when property values got really, really high back, you know, back in the 80s and the 80s and 90s, they started just really increasing the rural land and down the I-35 corridor is really where it started. And um, it stopped making sense for that to be the case. You must be in ag or timber to get a wildlife valuation. You cannot go from fair market valuation to ag or, or to wildlife, right? You have to go from fair market to ag to wildlife or already be in ag one or the other. Everybody understands the difference between fair market valuation, ag, wildlife, timber, all those, right? The no. Okay, so when, a, when an appraisal district calculates your taxes, they have a fair market value assigned to every single property. What they think the value of the property is in the open market. Okay, it's usually about 20% low, actually. Uh, most of the time, if you look at a tax roll number, it's, it's generally low. Um, so they, they multiply that by your tax rate, it takes 2%, and that's how they get your tax bill. So fair market values, Five hundred thousand dollars. You got a two percent tax rate. What's your annual taxes? Ten grand, right? Okay. If I'm not doing aggie math, you guys correct me. I am not doing math, uh, occasionally. Um, so ten thousand dollars would be your taxes. Same property. Same. Let's call it five. It's uh, fifty acres. Same property. Half million dollar value in an ag valuation. Now what they say instead of they still assign the fair market value. It's still on your tax sheet. But now what they say is. Um, 
what is the ag productivity or timber productivity? How much could this landowner reasonably make in revenue in any given year um, on this property? So let's call it, let's call it five thousand dollars. Okay, I can on this fifty acres if I was to raise cash, I could make five thousand dollars a year. That's probably pretty high. But so that tax rate does not change. A lot of people think this changes your tax rate. It does not. Your tax rate is calculated exactly the same way. So now it's five thousand dollars. So what are my taxes now? 100 bucks a year, right? 5,000 times 0.02, 100 bucks a year. Holy smokes. I just <coughs> saved $9,900 annually by getting this tax valuation. And that's a pretty fair number. Um, the, the, actual, the actual percentage is about, on any, kind of on an average, it's about 3,300%, 3,000 to 3,300%. So 30 to 30 times, 30 to 33 times lower in ag or wildlife as it, as it would be in fair market. So it's incredible tax savings. Um, so losing that valuation is a big deal. So when people can't do ag anymore, or they're not interested in ag anymore, or whatever the reason is that they don't want ag anymore, until 1995, there was nothing you could do about it. You just had to pay 3,000% uh, 3, more in taxes every year. Sorry. Okay, so that's why this was important. So this wildlife valuation allows them now to manage the property for native wildlife. When they wrote the law, they had to say, well, we can't just say, you know, you get to let birds out of your property and here we go. You know, they had to define wildlife management and kind of, when you're running cattle, they had intensity requirements, right? How many, how many goats per acre, how many animal units per acre? And when you see that animal units per acre that appraisal districts have, an animal unit is a cow-calf pair or seven goats, or you know, 14 chickens, or whatever. They have the number that equals an animal unit. Every appraisal district knows what that is to them. Um, and uh, so an animal unit, just think about that as a cow-calf pair, seven goats, you know, et cetera. Um, so they had to do the same thing for wildlife somehow. They had to say, well, what do we do? So they came up with seven categories of wildlife management. And we'll go through all of them. That's what the rest of the presentation is about. Supplemental shelter, supplemental water, census, uh, habitat control, there's seven of those that they came up with. They need, in wildlife management valuation, you've got to do three activities per year that fall in at least three of those categories. So one separate category for each activity, as long as you do three of those, you're fine. So if I, just very simplistically, I've got 67 acres in Burnett County per year, uh, that I'll use as, a, as an example throughout the presentation. It's under a wildlife management tax valuation for songbirds. Okay, that's my target species. And then I do some things for white tailed deer because I like to eat them. But uh, my, main, my main interest is managing for songbirds. Um, each year I do supplemental shelter for nest, uh, with nest boxes. I do supplemental uh, food with a feeder. Um, I do a bird census. I do habitat control, which is cutting my juniper down. And um, something else that I do. I can't remember. Oh, predator control for fire ants. So I'm fulfilling five categories out of the seven on my personal piece of ground, but that's just because I like doing it. And my son helps me, and you know, it's fun for me because I get to talk about it all the time. Now I get to actually do it. Um, so I need to do only three of those, really, but I just do five because it's enjoyable to me. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, three out of seven. That's a big thing you need to remember. <coughs> I get a question all the time. Well, what if they take this away from us? What if they just decide, well, we need more money on our rolls, and and uh, this is how we're going to get it. We're going to have to be wildlife folks. It'd be really difficult to do because this is in the Constitution. Okay, in 1995, House Bill 1351, uh, Proposition 11, passed the passed both houses of the legislature and amended Article 8, Section 1D1 of the Constitution. When you see 1D1 open space, you say, I bet you guys say it all the time. We got a 1D1 <laughs> valuation or ag valuation on it. The reason that 1D1 exists, it's Section 1D1 of the Constitution. That's where that comes from. Okay, so a 1D1 uh, exemption. That's what it means. But that law amended uh, Article 8 of the Constitution and put wildlife in there and uh, as a form of ag valuation, okay? So it's, an, it's, again, it's an alternative, all right? What we've been going over this whole time is it helps people keep their properties. It helps <coughs> new buyers be able to accept the fact that, that yeah, I'm, I wouldn't have bought that 67 acres that we've got um, had, had I not had this as an option. I don't want that much land if I've got to keep goats on it because I'm not a goat farmer at all in any way, shape, or form. Um, I spent my entire college years on the back of a horse in College Station. You know, I'm done with that. You know, uh, day working, working my way through college, so I'm I'm over it. Um, I want to I want to count birds and, and, and walk around. That's that's where I'm at on, on my land ownership. So 
I wouldn't have bought that. So it helps me be able to swallow that <coughs> and keep my taxes where I want them and, and not have to do that. Okay. The legislative purpose of this is kind of interesting, or it was to me when I learned it. This was not about saving the bunnies. That's not why this law was enacted. This law was to preserve open space. Current estimates say that the Texas population is going to double by what year? Does anybody know? Uh, 2025. 20 or 20, about 20, 2030 to 2040 is kind of when the Austin is going to double, they think, by 2035. You know, it's kind of on the high end. Uh, but, but uh, certainly by 2050 is the, the, the outside end that I've seen, the Texas population will double from what is it now? 20 oh, million or 20 million, something like that. So we're going to grow really, really rapidly. The problem with that is that they're not making any more of Texas, right? So these people are going to have to live somewhere, and it's going to be on rural land um, or land that wasn't rural now, or not rural now, but it will be someday. You know? <coughs> and it's going to be fragmented, fragmentation. 100-acre properties are going to go to 10-acre properties, and that's where 10 of those people are going to go. So they recognized this, you know, almost two decades ago and said, we got to do something because these ag landowners are having to sell their land too quickly for the wrong reason. And that's where this came from. The legislative purpose was to preserve open space. Okay? Mm. So this is a really important slide here. And I'll get out of the legalese, but let's talk about the tax code a little bit. If you don't have one, you should probably get one. Susan Combs will send you one. It's a book about that big and only about that much relevant to any of us, but go ahead. Let me ask something, Chris. If, if you have ag exemption on a piece of property uh -huh. or acreage and so forth, and say you maybe you want to do the wildlife exemption, uh, can you... Would that benefit you with less taxes, possibly, or would it be the? It's the same exact tax rate. It'd be the same tax rate. Yeah. Okay. Same tax rate and so same, that would, same valuation. If you're, if you're with ag exemption, it just there's no benefit. It's as low as it's going to get. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. But you still have to manage it, manage agriculture right. exactly to maintain. Yeah, to maintain. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you have to run a, yeah. a certain number of animal units per acre. Is how they yeah. figure that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So in the tax code. Um, Section 23.51, paragraph 7, what it says is it defines wildlife management as actively using land to propagate a sustaining breeding, migrating, or wintering population of indigenous wild animals for human use, including food, medicine, or recreation. Okay, so that's not the most difficult law I've ever read, but we'll go through it a little bit. Actively using my land, so your client or you, you can't just sit on the back porch and let the grass grow, right? That's not that's not how you do this. You have to actively do something on the property <coughs> to propagate. What does that word mean? Continue. To grow or yeah, to further grow. something, yeah, to yeah. help something uh, sustain. To propagate a sustaining, we'll talk about that word a little bit, breeding, migrating, or wintering. Well, from an ecology standpoint, if they breed here, migrate here, or winter through here, that covers the whole calendar year, you know, um, then that's what they're getting out there. Um, so it, it, it can be here at any time during the year. It doesn't have to necessarily stay here. <coughs> Population of indigenous native. Oh, native. <laughs> Historically occurring in the area is actually what indigenous means. All right, indigenous wild animals for human use. So you have to be doing it for a reason for, for humans. It has to be done for us. And just like cattle are raised for us, hay is produced for us in, indirectly. Okay, including food, medicine, and recreation. Well, food, that's pretty obvious. Medicine, I think they just copied that from the tax code because I have no idea. Um, or recre I've got some thoughts, but they're silly. Um, or, or recreation. So recreation is the big one, and that's why it's, that's why it's blue in there. Um, on my little 67 acres out there, I can manage it for songbirds, and all I have to do is say that I'm enjoying those songbirds. That's it. If recreation is not defined anywhere. It can be active or passive. I don't have to be shooting the songbirds um, or eating the songbirds or anything. I can be watching them. I can take my their songs. I can I can take my son out for a for a little walk and once a month and that's recreation. I can ride my mountain bike across it, which I do most mornings, and that's recreation. Okay. So it's very very loosely written. It's very there's no catches to this. It's it's really a well written law and, and written in, in favor of the landowner. Okay. Now that word sustain, does anyone have any questions about this? Makes sense. That word sustain is a, is a little bit of a hiccup for some people um, because, no, I'll, get, I'll come to that, because you have to sustain a population of indigenous wild animals. Okay. I talked to a guy this morning that was going to high fence his property in Fayette County and uh, run whitetail deer on it. Okay. He was going to breed whitetail deer and really, really want, his son in law actually really wants to grow some big bucks. That's what he called himself. Okay, great. <laughs> How many acres do you have? 150. Got a high fence. I said, well, 
He said, that's fine. I said, I'm not opposed to you doing that necessarily. I wouldn't do it if I had it, but I'm not opposed to you doing that. I said, do you know what the carrying capacity for whitetail deer in Fayette County on 150 acres is? And he said, no. I said, it's probably about 10 deer. A deer at every 15 acres or so is very, very common in Fayette County in that, that east, sort of east central Texas area. So I said, you got 10 deer out there. So what is your, you know, you get into some deer management stuff, your buck to doe ratio shows how many trophy bucks you can expect from those 10 deer as a percentage. Mm. It's not going to be very much fun, right? Mm. I said, so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to artificially sustain those animals, all right? Unless you have five or 700 acres in, in most of the state, it's too small to manage strictly for whitetail deer because you can't manage a sustained population, right? If you go to, if this gentleman had 30 deer on that Fayette County property and he went to the south of France for a summer and came back, how many deer is he going to have? Uh, Same number, they're all going to be dead though. Yeah. You're just going to have a bunch of deer skeletons, right? Um, and that's, then that's, it's true. I mean, it's a, kind of a joke, but it's absolutely true. You can't sustain that number there. So when we think about that word sustaining in terms of the context here, we want to be doing things, that are picking target species like songbirds, like, uh, like uh, small mammals, things that you can sustain on the appropriate size property. Now, if I had 6,700 acres instead of 67, white-tailed deer is a perfect option um, and probably need a white-tailed deer component to that plan. Since I've only got 67, I really didn't. I had kind of I wanted to write it for songbirds, but it's kind of a kind of a kind of a, uh, the most logical option, really, because I can sustain a population of songbirds on 67 acres, right? Because they just need vertical stuff. They don't need a lot of this. They just need vertical stuff. Okay. So that's where that word sustain comes in. If you have clients, that's part of that responsibility we were talking about. If you have clients that say, "Hey, man, I really want to buy this property so I can grow big bucks and high fence it and blah blah." Okay, great, good, but you need to know these things about that plan. Go ahead. So, in each county, there's in, in their record someplace you, you can find out, for example, how many acres you need to have white tailed deer. They don't cover the wildlife part of it. That's all just covered with, with uh, stock. That's all just covered with livestock. So, okay. those animal units per acre, their appraisal district does not translate those to white tailed deer. Okay. They, they just. But you can kind of you can kind of surmise that a white-tailed deer is about like a big goat. You know, they eat about the same things. They compete with goats 100%. Um, uh, so, you know, think about it like that. Most of Texas, just an FYI, most of Texas, on average, is about one deer per over 20 acres is a good number to shoot for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and remember, we're talking about sustaining. We're talking about sustaining. With, and the word sustaining means humans don't have anything to do with it. That's why that's why whitetail deer are in my plan, guys. I have about 25 resident deer. When we moved in and took the goats off, all the other goat people's whitetail deer went, and they live on our property now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do the math there, 67 for 20. That's way more than a deer for every 20 acres, right? I need three, I've got 25. Um, so we do a little bit of deer management. It's not because I don't want to see deer, or I hate deer, I don't like deer. Um, it's because that's too many. It interferes with my songbird management. It's not good for the property. It's not good for the deer. Uh, it's, it's true. I mean, you have to harvest some deer to keep the deer healthy. Uh, just like if you have a fishing pond, you have to take bass of it out of it every year uh, to keep the rest of your bass, health, bass healthy. Right? Okay. Don't want to belabor that too much, but just understand that that sustaining word is very, very important. So you may have heard from an appraiser or someone that there's a minimum acreage requirement for the wildlife tax valuation. It's kind of true and not. If you're already in ag, if the property's already in agriculture, I don't care if it's five acres or five million, and if you know somebody with five million acres, I'd like to talk to you. After <laughs> but if it's five acres or five million, you can convert it from ag to wildlife, period. End of story, end of question. If it's three acres, it's gonna be a battle. The appraisal district's not gonna like it, but legally speaking, there's no minimum acreage to convert from ag to wildlife, okay? <clears throat> because there's no minimum acreage on the ag valuation, all right? What about the other way around? Or... Going from wildlife to ag? Uh -huh. um, what I would say about that is that there needs to be, there's not, but there needs to be a minimum acreage requirement for agriculture. Because if I've only got 10 acres and I'm supposed to be running a cow to every 20, or an animal unit to every 20, I can only have half a cow. And that's hard to manage. <laughs> I mean, it, it just it doesn't make mathematical sense. It's never going to work. It's not going to produce anything. It's not going to make the guy any money. It's not going to be fun. 
just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So there probably needs to be. So if you're going that way from wildlife to ag, maybe a little bit more with five. If you've got five acres that are already is already in wildlife, going back to ag could be tricky. If you have an appraiser that thinks through the math a little bit, could be a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Going from fair market to ag is a little bit funky, even though there's not a limit on the ag valuation. There's not a minimum size. If the appraiser were to say, well, you need um, an animal unit for, for 15 acres and you don't have 15 acres, so what are you going to do? Well, I've got to do bees or I've got to do chickens or I've got to do something else that makes sense. You know, I can't do a real traditional cows or hay or, you know, something like that. So, hay not work uh, in some instances. Hay might be your best bet. But anyway. Fair market to wildlife, how's that? Fair market to wildlife is impossible. You have right? to be an ag person. Right, you've got to be grandfathered in. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. There's a program called Ecolab. And I won't, I'm not going to talk very much about it, but if you have a property that's over about 50 acres or there's something really special about it, like Lake Travis Front, something like that, like uh, Paternalis River Frontage, something, 50 acres in fair market, there's a program called Ecolab where if your client's got a little cash flow, you can kind of buy yourself into an ag valuation very quickly. Um, you allow, they, they allow researchers, university researchers on their property for two years and you can get that valuation starting in, like right now, we're going through a round to start in 2014. Okay, so I mean, you immediately get the low tax valuation, but you have to pay for those researchers. That's the catch, you're paying for that research. So what's the minimum, minimum lot size? Um, 50 acres is where we try to do We invented, the, or David Braun invented the law. I mean, he, he literally wrote it and got it passed. Um, and so we manage it. I think we're the only people that actually do it. Um, and so we, we market those properties to the researchers. Uh, they, the property owner pays legal fees and they also pay, the, pay for the research. Literally, they are writing a check, paying for the research. Uh, but a lot of times, it's about the same amount. If that guy's got 50 acres on Lake Travis, it's in fair market, his taxes are you know, $35,000 a year, we can do it for $35,000 a year real easily. So he may spend 50,000 in two years, but that's already a savings for him. And then after year three, researchers get off. He doesn't have to write that check anymore. And his taxes are $1,000 a year. Big one. Wow. Right. So really huge deal there. Wow. It doesn't fit a lot of properties, but a lot of people it really helps out. Okay. So if you know somebody that's lost a valuation or they've got a big property without one, um, that's a good way to do it. You say that moves Research. it over to ag mm -hmm. or not to it wildlife? It moves it directly to Ecolab, which is the fourth special use valuation. Okay. There's ag, timber, wildlife, and Ecolab. Okay, then from Eco so, Lab, you would then move to Wildlife. You can go directly to Wildlife. Once you're in okay. one of those four, you can switch between them as you'd like. Okay. So once you get in Eco Lab, you can go to Ag or Wildlife. Can you stay at Eco Lab? Just... Sure, if you want to keep posting research or the universities agree to start paying for it, but it, it, you know, I mean, there's people well, out there. What's a posting here. research? What does that mean? They, they, the, the mandate says that they have to come out and do research uh, that benefits the wildlife community. Um, so you have, you have research and you have experts to go out? Or? The, the university has master students, PhD students that are looking for real property to use. And so we, ma we uh, market those properties on a special website every summer. We go out and do a habitat se assessment on the property. We market those, uh, those, re those research properties on the website. The universities start getting on that website about May and picking out properties that they want. We tell the landowner what property, what universities uh, have selected them and what they're going to be researching, and they pick from one of them. And, what and is which, the expense for the, so you have what is the payment to the, to the people that are coming to research? It depends on what the research costs. I mean, but if it's 20000 if it's a cost, right? Yeah, you're paying for the research. So if the research, if they need $20,000 for two years to do this research, you're going to write a check for forty grand over two years. Um, so, but, like I said, so they come out and analyze your property? Is we that, do. Is that what they do? We'll come out and analyze it and market it. The researchers pick from that website. We put that habitat assessment that we do up on a website. And the universities come and, and choose which properties they want to. They wanna, so if, say you've got a kid at a and Kingsville that wants to study grass. And I've got a heck of a grass property. Plateau would come out to my property, write the habitat assessment, put it on the website. The kid sees that. Oh, my gosh, there's you know, native grass all over this property. That's one that I want to do. We go and tell the landowner, hey, we got this guy from Kingsville, wants to do a grass research project. Your property fits the bill. It's going to be $15,000 the first year and 10 the second year. Uh, here's what your legal fees will be. You want to sign up for it. Oh, goodness. Is, is the tax savings typically more than what the research costs? We try to make it at least, a, at, at the very most, at the very minimal, a five-year payout. Okay. 
that makes sense. So yes. maybe your taxes are ten thousand dollars a year, and in a crazy world, this costs you fifty thousand dollars. That's about the limit of what we would do. Most of the time, we can do it for what your taxes are. Okay. Now, I'm speaking to the ones that, that do that process, but most of the time, if your taxes are, if you're a real good candidate, your taxes are twelve, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. We can usually do it for that. So okay, it matches the taxes, and the taxes go away. Well, after after the first year, the taxes go away, but you've yeah. kind of replaced it with paying for that that right. research. Right. And then after the research should go away, well, that's when the magic happens. Yeah. yeah. The magic. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this minimum acreage requirement a little bit. We can talk about eco lab so complex we can go yeah. through it all day. Let's talk about the minimum acreage requirement. Just get back into it. So there is a way to go from fair market to wildlife, from, from fair market to ag or eco lab to wildlife, right? So there's a way to do that. But there's not a way to go from, from directly into fair market to wildlife. The minimum acreage requirement that everybody always talks about is when you go from ag to wildlife on a small property. Okay, there is a minimum acreage requirement for that. Okay, so by appraisal region, there's a threshold, and it varies all the way across the state. There's a formula that the appraisers use to figure it out, and I can tell it to you if you want to. But just know that in this appraisal region right here, and every one that you guys probably work in, I mean, it, it goes from uh, from the yellow to all the way over to the green. It starts changing over here. <coughs> and that one's a little bit different. But in, in this appraisal region that we sit in right here, uh, the minimum acreage requirement to, go, to convert from ag to wildlife is 16.6 acres. Okay, 16.6. And then that's a funky number, but then there's a funky formula that goes along with it. Um, that means if you've got 12 acres and you're in ag, um, you, need to, you need to stay in ag. Now, the reason I tell you this, I'm kind of saying this wrong. There's not a minimum acreage, so let me start with, there's not a minimum acreage to convert that, from ag to wildlife. If you sell the property, though, there's a minimum acreage to keep it. So, kind of mess that up a little bit. There's not a, if you've got 16.6 acres, you can convert from ag to wildlife all day long, okay? If I'm already in wildlife, that's where I messed this up. If I'm already in wildlife, I have to have, I have to retain 16.6 .6 acres to keep it that way. The best way I know to do this is a, is a scenario, kind of a formula. So if I've got 100 acres, and this gentleman wants to buy 10 of it, and it's in wildlife, and I convert, it's low, and I sell it to him, it's, that 10 acres is lower than that 16.6, .6, correct? Mm -hmm. He can't convert it to wildlife. He would have to keep it in ag for at least one year and then convert it. He would lose that valuation uh, if he didn't go back to ag. Okay, so my 90 is fine. I'm, I'm good on my, on my part. Okay, but if I sold him 20 acres, we could both stay in wildlife without having to do any funky stuff. We could both just reapply and be in wildlife. Okay, because we're both above that. If you have, so sorry I messed that up a little bit. Is everybody, did I retract? Okay, all right. So if there's a, a wildlife management property association, okay, then the property can be smaller, 12.5 acres in this appraisal region. So that, that probably hits a, a little bit different note on, on some of your clients. That's why I was saying that that, that landowner, land, that uh, development in Blanco stuck with those black puck because all those properties are eight acres or six acres or whatever they are. Only the ones bigger than 12.5, if there's a volatile management association, could ever, could ever uh, convert back if they sold that, right? So. Um, Go ahead. Well, I sold a property uh, west of Dripping Springs, just off of uh, 290, and uh, it, it was in a wildlife, the, the development was mm -hmm. a wildlife, uh, in, in a, in a uh, an association, yeah, yeah. and, uh, but, but the tract of land wasn't, you know, the small tract of land wasn't anywhere close to Yeah, because it was grandfathered in from ag, <laughs> so they ag, they built they, that association, went all the way to wildlife. Get it that way. Okay. See what happens when you're a developer and you, you start a thousand acre development. The developer owns all of it. Whatever whatever LLC owns that big tract of land, right? A thousand yeah. acres. Yeah. So if it's in, if they convert all of it to wildlife, which normally they do, they'll convert it all to wildlife. When they start selling lots, as soon as that lot is alienated, if it's less than twelve and a half acres, it can't have that wildlife management valuation anymore. Wait. So. Oh, okay. So. Oh. Does it matter if it was split up because of family inheritance? 
Um, yeah, you had a big plot. Yeah, so if, it, if it's alienated, yeah, no matter you, what, yeah, no matter what, that name changes. Even a family. Sometimes you can get away if it's a family LLC and it goes to members of the LLC individually. Sometimes they'll let you do that. Um, but the big catch about that WMPA is if they're if they want to do a conservation development, you know, that's what you always see because they're just going to be <coughs> more than an acre and a half. Um, if they want to do something like that, those tracks better be bigger than 12 and a half acres because if they go, if they keep it in ag, those tracks can convert no matter what. Okay, they can always convert because they're in ag. But as soon as they convert it to wildlife, when they alienate that property and and developer LLC doesn't own that property anymore, that landowner better have more than 12 and a half acres when they refile that plan and they'll lose the valuation. Can they go to ag? They can go to. They yeah, they, they could go, they, well, they could keep it in ag. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're in wildlife, going to ag, again, you get into that sustainability question. Because of the size. Yeah. Legally, I think they can. I don't think a lot of appraisal districts would go for it, though. Yeah. So it might be a real big fight. And if none of your neighbors are doing it, it'd be rough. Yeah. And you got to go sustaining insects or something. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you really need to sustain? So, <laughs> so if, the, if the development is already in wildlife, um, and you're selling up a property, it better be 12 and a half acres or larger if it's in the Wildlife Management Property Association. Yeah. The other thing is a lot of developers don't, don't take that step, so they're still stuck at the 16.6, okay? Um, now over at College Station, these numbers are uh, 14 and 11 or something like that. So they, they change throughout the state no matter where you are. But you can call the chief appraiser and ask him what his, what his uh, WMPA number is. <laughs> okay, now are there tracks in Texas that are five acres or less that have these exemptions because they were grandfathered? Sure, there. there's five acre tracks that are in ag all day, okay. all day long. Okay, so um, can you explain the how the grandfathering works? I mean, can that still be done? Um, if the track's been in ag and the appraisal the district feels like they're successfully managing their ag valuation, then yeah, it, it, it's done all the time. It? What if they want to sell it? I just, uh, part of that 67 acres that we bought was a 5.45 acre track that had ag on it. Um, and uh, they told me I could keep the ag valuation. I said, well, I'm going to go very well. And she said, okay. But Robin Copeland in Burnt County was cool with that happening. So, okay, so so let's say that there's uh, four contiguous owners of five acres each. They can't get any of these exemptions. Four, so say your numbers again? Four contiguous Owners, Four contiguous owners of five acres, five each. acres each. So we got a total of 20 acres. <coughs> they can't consolidate, can they, and get the exemption for all four since they're contiguous? No. That's on 12 point it has to be 12. It has to, from, to, you're talking about fair market to. Yes, from fair, yeah, fair from market. Fair market to. Ag, but. To, yeah, they yeah, have yeah. to each establish their own ag history. Then they can consolidate once they had ag, which, by the way, how's that process work? It's five years of agricultural history, and on the sixth, basically the sixth year, you apply and get the valuation. So it's five years of history paying full market taxes. Sixth year, you get the valuation. On the seventh year, they can form a WMPA and get all that into wildlife because it's been in ag for a year. They can get it into wildlife. But if one of them ever sold the property, it would take that five acres out, and they couldn't do anything. Right, it. and and for them to do that, they don't have to consolidate the property into one ownership, they can actually have four different ownerships and still um, do that process you're talking about and get the, the ag exemption. Is that what you're saying? Possibly. The appraisal district would let it, but I, I don't, on five acres, yeah. you're just establishing yeah. an ag history on five acres yeah. is hard. Now, yeah. this year there's a new law, this is getting real complicated, this year there's a new law that allows you to use beekeeping um, on five to 20 acres. You can use beekeeping, new of 2013, but it is extensive. You have to have at least, in Travis County, you have to have at least six hives. They have to be managed. You have to produce a, you have to actually be producing honey, a, mark, a, a commercially viable product has to be produced, okay? And it still takes that five-year history. Yeah. So you're going to be managing bees for six years. Now, you probably need to You probably find somebody to do that. Um, but each hive setup is 1200 bucks per hive. You know, it's not an easy deal. That's cheaper than building a fence, um, especially if you own 18 or 19 acres. You're, you're way up there on the on that 5 to 20 scale. It's 
cheaper than milk, man. So. Gives but this hives. Hives. What's that? Six hives, you said? Six Gives hives. you hives. How many bees are that? Lots. If you, I got a question. If you've got several landowners that's got substantial acreage continue, continuous with each other and they want to establish a wildlife management association, what, what, what's, what's, what's the deal on that? What, what, How does that, how's that work? You, you have to form the association as an entity, right? And so a, a, a lawyer would put that together for you. And it has to be, uh, it has to be a wildlife management plan association or property association is how that's worded. Um, Cassie Gresham and Bronnie Gresham is the one that does all of those for, for our clients. We just finished one in Brazos County um, because they were all um, they were all 10 acres or 9, 10, and maybe 11 acres. But Marcus and BCAT, see, that even though they're closed, we need all those to be 11.1 .1 acres if you're going to do a wild means property association with them. And uh, so we regrew some lot lines and made them all 11.1 .1 <laughs> acres. And then we formed so the association. You have to have a minimum. Of each, each property owner would have to have a minimum. Okay. Yeah, that's that's so what that number subdivide, okay. okay. subdivide the lots. We did on this case because one of them was like eleven four, and the neighbor was ten two. Wow. That takes a long time. So we had to just we had well, Cassie yes. did it pretty quickly, but yeah. But and and Marcus at Brazos Cad was supportive of what we were doing. He was okay. You know, he knew what we were doing, and so um, he was fine. Craig, another example of the developer that's got a thousand acre sells five acre lots, and they are alienated. Does his balance then uh, retain the, the wildlife exemption? His balance does until he gets down to and, uh, until he gets he down to twelve and a half acres or whatever it is. Yeah, in that crazy region. That's right. I have a question. Yes. So let me understand. So if a developer is currently an egg and he's now selling uh, his land in five acre increments, um, when he sell, sells the five acres. Does the person that he sold the five acres to, is that still remain egg? Yes. The person has to refile okay. their, wild, their agricultural evaluation in okay. their name. Okay. And it may still remain egg. Even though the egg exemption, they've got longhorn roaming. <laughs> so does that individual buyer of the five acres, does he have to go out and get animals to put on his certainly would. Okay. Certainly would. Or, or have somebody lease it. There just has to be ag on the property. He doesn't have physically have to be administering that. Okay, gotcha. But, but he has to do something. Okay. I know there's a lot to this guy. I have to help you out. But that's not that first example. But is there any, is our fairly clear here? Yeah. Clear as well. So we've got a, what's that? College. Yeah, count, call the county you're in or learn your appraisal regions. You know, they're on, uh, I think Texas Parks and Wildlife has this exact map on there and figure out that. Uh, so. Y'all probably have it, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yep, right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we, we, know, we know more often than not what county, what fall, you know, what the number is in each county, uh, more often than not. Is there, any, is there anything funky about Williamson County? No, the numbers match the 16.5 and 12. Yeah. Thank you. They should match that too. Anything that's kind of along the I-35 corridor, once you get east of 35, the appraisal regions get small quickly. Uh, where the numbers get small quickly. Okay. So, getting back to the Wildlife Association plan, is that you have to have an attorney to work up that information. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it, does it take a long time? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did we this one in Brass County in Belmont. Okay. That's pretty quick. So, Craig, uh, back to your earlier uh, marketing. Uh, if we are consulting with or selling somebody yeah. tract of land and we need to know answers to that, we have them call you. That's sure. <coughs> Absolutely. The best way to get the answers. That's the best way to get it. Yeah. And we'll be happy to take those calls. Okay. Okay, so we've just got a little bit of time left. We're going to get out after I one. I want to go through the, the plan process, kind of some of those activities now that we kind of have a grasp on what the valuation is and what we're going to do with it and some of the numbers. Let's go through the kind of the, the blocking and tackling as far as administering one of these plans. So you need to pick a target species. I believe I haven't said that just like that, but you need to pick a target species for your plan. You need to pick at least three categories that you're going to manage with that target species, preferably more. A plan, really, the ones we write look like a menu. You know, 
Joe John's going to do this one, this one, this one, but he can do this one and this one. We're going to put more in there than what he needs. Uh, okay, so um, so if one year he just doesn't have the budget for his $20,000 brush management project that we wrote up for him that he wanted to do, it just was a bad year, um, he's got another option. He can go He can go do a bird census that he hasn't been doing, and that, that fulfills it. Okay. Some of the target wildlife that we talk about, uh, white-tailed deer is always a big one in Texas, but we've kind of already belabored that a little bit. Turkey, songbirds, bats, quails, small mammals, butterflies, whatever they want to manage for, literally. It has to be indigenous, has to be kingdom animalia, it has to be an animal, it can't be a fish or a plant. Um, well, fish or kingdom animalia, but it can't be a fish. Um, because we own the fish, that's the deal with that. If you have fish on your property, you own them, unless they're in an navigable river, so um, it can't be something that you own. Um, and no plants. So, you know, those are the common ones. Songbirds and songbirds, turkey, and deer are probably the main ones. And some small animal plants we write. Right? Songbirds, turkey, and deer are 80% of the ones we write. How do you do bats? Yeah. Bat, house. bat houses, uh, having a good supply of water where they can feed. It's a bats are an interesting one to try to get three activities out of. Songbirds, seven. Plenty easy to do. You know, white-tailed deer is easy to do seven. So is songbirds, yeah. is, it just, is it just having water and feeders? You can do, uh, well, I mean, it can be just that, but uh, remember, there's seven categories, right. so you can do things for all seven of them. You need three activities. Right, water. exactly, but yeah. you need three yeah, activities. Yeah, yeah. Water, yeah. feeders, and uh, census would be three. Okay. Right? Water, feeders, and fire and control would be three. And yeah, bread control. So just remember, it means actively using the land. So let's talk about the activities. Supplemental food, supplemental water, supplemental shelter. Habitat control, erosion control, predator control, and census are the seven categories. Okay. How, how do they do the census? Um, it, like a bird survey that we do is we pick points of the property and we come out, stay at a point for 15 or 20 minutes, move to the next point, stay there for 15 or 20 minutes, move to the next point, count every bird that you see and hear. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll be standing there with one of our biologists and I'll see five birds and I'm thinking, hey, I five birds. How many did you get, Mark? Oh, 13. Because uh, he heard them, you know, without ever seeing them, he you just have heard to them. You identify them. Yeah, by their yeah, call. yeah, yeah. You're not just out there counting birds. You have to be what species it was. You gotta, you gotta learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I haven't. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the birds are tough. I mean, they really are. So I'm getting better at my ID, you know, uh, visual ID. But you know, learning those songs is tough. But, so that's how you do a census. I suppose, I suppose uh, birds, birds are uh, professional birds. Yes, could they make a living birds. helping yeah. folks like sure, you around sure. the state? Absolutely. And we do contract with some birds. Most of, most, I mean, ninety percent of our surveys we do in house, but we'll contract. We have one in Palestine. You know, uh, Victor Emanuel. Um, anyway, uh, but black-tailed deer census. If you did a camera survey or an aerial survey or a spotlight count, you know that all that all counts. So any kind of a small mammal survey, you know, with remote cameras and little sit stations is how you do that. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to do a survey. All right. So those are the seven categories. There's deadlines for all those, right? You have to do them every so often? No, you have to do them to a certain intensity level that we'll talk about. And you have to do them when it makes sense. We'll talk about that too. So supplemental food, we're going to do, I mean, that, there's seven of these. We're going to do seven slides. Supplemental food, um, everything that you could imagine. The most common one by far, though, is just using some kind of feeder. Spin cast corn feeders do not qualify for white tailed deer because the feeder goes off. Feeder goes off when you say it goes off, so the food's not available to them all the time. And you're feeding corn a lot of times because corn's nutritionally vacant. Uh, it's like doing a kid a candy bar, doesn't hurt them, but it doesn't do anything real good either. Um, so, so that doesn't count. If you wanted to do a protein feeder for white tailed deer, that's fine. Protein block feeder like we make is fine, uh, but something where it's free choice and uh, it's nutritionally valuable. Um, our most common, you know, feeder that we that we sell and that, that a lot of people use um, is some version of a, of a barrel and, and, and free choice bird feeder, whether it's on the ground for quail or, or turkey or where it's up high for turkey or songbirds, you know, just some sort of large free choice feeder like that. That's the most common one for birds. That's how I do my songbird feeder, uh, is just like that. So uh, one of those, ever 150 acres or so qualifies. Okay, so. Um, that's probably not enough in my mind. I think I probably need a second one on my property just to kind of make me feel better. Um, so that's very subjective, but, but um, a lot of these intensity requirements are in the law and a lot of them aren't. So when we talk about how many you're supposed to do of something, sometimes it's subjective. Sometimes it's just what we've had experience with. So that's supplemental food. You need to be feeding year-round. There's some exceptions to that, but most of the time you need to have food available all the time if that's one of your qualifying activities. 
All right. Supplemental water, big thing in Texas. Um, a pond does not count as supplemental water. Unless you're feeding a small pond that's lined with a well, you know, it doesn't need to be qualified as supplemental water. Don't have people run well water into a nasty hill country tank that leaks like a sieve. You know, that's not good stewardship. Um, so ponds, by and large, don't qualify as supplemental water. Okay? If you, well, I will give that in a second. Um, these water tables is probably the most common thing we see is some form of that. Mm -hmm. That's ours. That they catch rainwater off the roof, feed the gutter. It feeds this 305 gallon tank and then fills this uh, little dog pan up here. And that, that's your supplemental water source right there. Um, and uh, you know, hogs don't mess with it because it's such a small area. There's there's a couple of those like that on the market. Um, but that's that's supplemental water. It counts as a 10 year activity to put one of those things out there. So for the next 10 years, you only need two activities, right? Because you got one for 10 years. Um, I would subject to you that even after 10 years, that they'll probably still count it. So, pretty pretty neat little uh, way to do supplemental water. Um, the intensity requirement on those is a bit loose. You know, one for uh, one for property is kind of how I understand it. The appraisal guidelines, I would say that that one 150 acres or so is probably a good idea. You know, I would not if I had a thousand acres, I would not just put one of those out there. The drought doesn't affect that at all. I mean, I mean that black tank will hold water for as long as it, it can. Uh, you're going to lose some to evapotranspiration, but um, We've had some of these go dry in the past, like in 2011, but it doesn't happen very often. And you can always walk up to it and pour water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's possible as well, or fill it with a hose or something like that. So um, there's ways to supplement it. Okay. But in the summertime, it needs to have water in it for sure, because if it doesn't and they want to come check on it, that's not going to look too good. Right? Okay, supplemental shelter. Um, by far, the most common thing that we see people do with supplemental shelter is nest boxes. Um, I don't know how many of these we sell, sell every year, but it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, and I use them. Um, the nest box intensity requirement is one nest box for every five acres, not to exceed 40. So if you've got 200 acres, you need 40. If you've got 240 acres, you just need 40. Right? If you need 500 acres, you just need 40. Okay? So one nest box for every five acres. That is varies by appraisal region. In Brazos County, it's one nest box for every three acres. In El Paso, it's one to every 50. So it just it varies by. But you can have more. Absolutely, and That's I would. I'd have five extra just in case. Yeah, just in case. How much is a nest box? What's that? What's in a nest box cost? Uh, 25 bucks. That's true. We install and we charge for the installation on ours. So, uh, but, but yeah, you can get a nest box for pretty cheap. Buy if you buy nest boxes and for whatever reason don't buy ours. Buy ones that are made out of cedar or juniper, you know, cedar wood because in Texas it gets too hot for the plastic ones, PVC ones a lot of times get a little hot. We sell a PVC blue bird box, but it's big enough that it's, it's okay. Um, they make ones made out of concrete, I and mean, they make them out of all kinds of stuff. It just gets too hot here to use those. So you don't only wind up with four legs. Um, so, mill shelter is very important. And somebody said something about it being filled with wasps. Oh yeah. That's okay. This is not a results-based deal, right? Okay. You don't have to have birds in every single box to be able to qualify. Right. You provided the shelter. If the birds chose not to use it, that's their problem. Um, so you want to have the right kind of stuff out there for the right species that are present. I've got 16 boxes on my property, or 18, and I've got five bluebird boxes, and only those five were used this year. The rest of them are, are there's nothing. And, and I haven't checked all of them, every single one of them, but I don't think any of the rest of them got used. But those five bluebird boxes did. That's fine. Um, that's just, yeah, that's what needed shelter on the property. Apparently the wrens and titmouses didn't need any shelter because I know I've got both species, but they didn't use the boxes. So. There you go. Any questions? Yeah, what kind of compliance, uh, uh, who checks compliance? Or the, the appraisal district is, the, they are solely responsible for, for monitoring this stuff. So if they want to come visit, they can. If they want to send you an annual report request, they can do that where you provide documentation for your activities each year. Travis Williamson, Hayes, Blanco, Burnett, Lampasas, Lano, uh, Bear, Guadalupe, Comal, Bastrop, all of them ask for annual reports every year. Is there some annual. sort of an annual report to do? Uh, they send a, they send a, yeah. they'll send a form. Only if they ask? Yep, if they, they send a form with the letter. And if they ask, you have to fill it out and return it. And I would definitely provide some photos or receipts or some sort of documentation for your activities. 
take pictures of your firing treatment, take pictures of your boxes, you know, that kind of thing. We have just a couple more of these if you want to finish the yeah, yeah, yeah. So habitat control, um, really if you're going to manipulate the plants on your property, that's habitat control. Um, brush management can, can, can pretty much encompass all of that. Prickly pear, cedar, mesquite, uh, wee sash, yopon, any of the suspect species, Chinese tallow, china berry, ligustrum, all of those species can fall under that brush management component. The intensity requirements, one, uh, 10 percent of the property, not to exceed 10 acres, or 10 percent of the brush management area, actually. You define a brush management area on your property, 10 percent of that, not to exceed 10 acres each year. Okay, so you have to do, you know, a fair amount of brush management. Like on my property, my brush management area is 30 acres, and I have to do three percent a year. Okay. Any other questions? There's seven of these. One more minute, so go ahead. Yeah, there's seven of these. <laughs> erosion control. Um, if you're going to do erosion control on your property, um, basically what that means is new lake construction or a major repair costs a lot of money. It's a ten year, another ten year activity. The intensity requirement is very loose. I mean, if you're doing earth, earth, earth work at all, if you with a machine, that's that qualifies. So new lake construction, major repair, gully shaping, any of that kind of stuff is erosion control. What's considered lake versus pond? You know? it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be some kind of a uh, barrier, but so it doesn't just sink through the... It doesn't have to be. <coughs> there needs to be a lot of times in the hill country, right. but it doesn't have to be. Okay. All right. Well, what do you what do with uh, feral hogs? I mean, what is your that's, predator? That's what I'm talking shooting. about. Predator control, feral hogs, you shoot them or trap them. Um, you, this is one of the ones you do kind of have to be successful with. Um, if you don't have, if, you, if you're not being successful trapping or shooting feral hogs, you probably don't have a problem to begin with. They're not going to count that very many years. Uh, firing control, um, you pour bait around the mound, uh, take a photo of it. That's your firing control. You need to do 10 acres of that on, on or 10 percent, whichever more in this instance, as far as the uh, intensity requirements concerned. Predator control can be every single plant, guys. I mean, everybody's got either firings or feral hogs. That's predator control and the census. census yeah, they can be uh, on some birds. <coughs> if you've got a white-tailed deer plant, raccoons don't need to be in there as a predator. <coughs> census, we've already talked about up front. Songbird, census, small game, census, white-tailed deer, all those things. So, sorry we had to click through those, but we'd spend a lot of time on those. Yeah,